and welcome back. Today I'm joined by Alex Sulkin. And Alec, how about you introduce yourself? Oh, hey, I'm Alex Sulkin. I'm a writer and executive producer on Family Guy, coming at you from Cape Cod, Massachusetts, in the United States. Wow, well, that's that's awesome. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Family Guy, and like I said, American Dad, and just both types. It you know, it's so cool talking to you, man. You don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I'm a big fan of Ireland. If that makes any difference have you uh, ever visited i have it's wow. gorgeous I, I i love it um beautiful I'm, I'm a big fan of uh the uk in general i i made my wife uh promise me she loves to travel and i don't really like traveling and she likes to take a big trip every year and so i said i'll do it if you promise that once every four years we can go somewhere uh in the uk you know and so we've, we've been doing that, which is nice. We've been to, been to Ireland. We've been to uh, London and the Cotswolds and Wales. Oh, that's really nice. Yeah. Just uh, should let you know, Ireland isn't in the UK. There yeah, isn't. I, I kind of felt like that when I was saying it. And I'm sure it's a touchy <laughs> subject. But I, I'm, I've lumped you together like the ignorant American that I am. I uh, know. It's okay. Just... I know if my co-host was here, who's very uh, <laughs> adamant no. on that fact, and that he yeah. would shoot me if he watched this back. But uh, yeah, <laughs> no regular people, Collins. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. But um, how did you get into comedy, first of all? Um, because it's very adamant you work in uh very different fields of comedy. Yeah, yeah. So uh, how I got into it in the first place was just. Basically, by realizing, uh, you know, in, in college that there wasn't, you know, I, I didn't see myself doing much else. You know, I, I had uh, an uncle who uh, did something called sports marketing, which is basically like kind of like an advertising firm. Uh, that, and they worked with the NBA uh, basketball league. And uh, so I used to work with him in the summers when I was in college, like as, you know, sort of an intern. And I enjoyed it, but I couldn't, I just always had it in mind that I wanted to be writing in particular comedy. Um, so I was lucky enough uh, at the end of my college, uh, when I was a senior in college, to get uh, an internship at Saturday Night Live. So I was, you know, spending half my time in college and then I would go down to New York City and, and spend the end of the week at Saturday Night Live. And, and it was just great. And so through there, you know, I met some different people and uh, I started doing stand up in, in New York. And luckily enough, a couple of years later, one of those people that I met there um, became a writer on a, on a late night uh, television show. It was called The Late Late Show with Craig Kilborn. It was on uh, after Letterman back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. So um, I was lucky enough to get a job there. I submitted my material and thankfully they liked it. So I moved out to Los Angeles in 1999 and, uh, you know, haven't, re haven't looked back. So um, uh, I was on The Late Late Show for about three years and then went into sitcoms and again met cool people one of them being Seth MacFarlane and that was at a point when Family Guy was off the air it had been canceled uh, but I became friendly with him and he said you know hey they're talking about bringing Family Guy back if they do I'd like you to come work there and um, I, that didn't sound likely to me <laughs> but uh, sure enough, as you know, it happened and, and I've been there basically ever since 2004. So that's that was a, a, a very lucky uh, meeting for me that I, I you know, happened to work with Seth on one of these other shows that didn't really go anywhere. But mm -hmm. that brought me to Family Guy and in turn that that put me into the, you know, Ted and, and the Western and all that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. it's been great. And what was that transition like for you um, from writing Family Guy to writing feature length films? Well, I mean, I would say it wasn't that difficult. You know, I think a lot is made of like the difference between writing uh, for TV and, and for movies and, and that kind of stuff. But 
in truth, I don't think it's that much different. Um, I think it's sort of like if you're a drama writer and you write drama for television, if you're a good drama writer, then you could write a dramatic movie. You just have to make it longer. I mean, that's, it's just a math thing. And it's the same way with comedy. You know, if, if you can write funny stuff um, for, for a half an hour show, so you just work you know, four times as much and you, you write it for a, for a two hour movie. I mean, it's, that's a little bit of an oversimplification. We worked for a really long time on the first Ted, but, you know, I was working there in the room with Seth, just like we did on family guy. So it didn't, it didn't feel that much different. Um, but it was, you know, obviously an incredibly gratifying experience in the end. Yeah, no, um, the first Ted and both Ted films, they're both, they're both hilarious and it feels like you're watching uh, just a longer episode of Family Guy sometimes I feel when I'm watching it. <laughs> That's true. Well, Ted, Ted sounds like Peter Griffin, so it's, yeah, but... it's very easy to kind of uh, slip in and out of that that reality. But yeah, no, the, those, I mean, uh, the first Ted just came out great and, and uh, it was a really, and it was so much fun writing for Ted 2 and writing the Western there and filming them. They were all, it was all really fun mm. yeah it sounds like you and uh, Seth have this very close relationship um does is he as involved as the writing as he was a couple of years ago or is he kind of taking a step back lately he's taking a step back um you know he's focused on uh the Orville mm. um and just other projects that come down the pipe so he's not in the writer's room anymore um which is uh, good and bad. I mean, it's it's bad because he was always like the funniest one there. And also he can do all the voices. So when he's pitching jokes, you know, he can pitch it in a character's voice. So, you know, right away if it's gonna work or not. Um, but it's also, it's it, it can be a good thing because um, I feel like now that the show is, you know, it's been on the air for so long, a lot of the writers that work there have been there either s since the beginning or since right around when I got there, which is now over 15 years ago. So we all kind of know how it works. We know what he likes and what he doesn't like for the most part, you know, occasionally there are still things that he'll, he'll read them and be like, this stinks, you know, <laughs> but for the most part, you know, we have a pretty great schedule now because we got have a bunch of, uh, men and women who have, who have been there a long time and we just we know when we when we when we've got it and has production been affected by COVID at all or were you able to work during it well we were pretty lucky um, I wouldn't say that it it wasn't affected at all I mean I think that our production team did a fantastic job in terms of um, you know switching up the way we do things when COVID hit. Uh, they were, they enabled a lot of the um, artists and, you know, other production team members to work from home mm. by giving them whatever computer facilities they needed. And uh, we were able to record people from their homes, you know, like we get, we get Mila Kunis in her own closet recording and, you know, a lot of stuff going on like that. But obviously, since it's animated and we, nobody has to be on a set, that was a huge advantage for us. Um, so uh, animation was definitely unique and fortunate uh, in this time in that we didn't really have to miss a step. You know, it was just a, maybe maybe a week or two of production working out the logistical side of things. But from the writer's side, we really didn't miss a step. You know, we just went right on zoom and have the writer's assistants on there with us and and we could just kind of keep on going um we've talked to bruce thomas on the show before he's a voice actor for the newest call of duty game and he was telling us because he would have to do certain lines where he screams uh, that he would have to go break bake brownies after and give them to his neighbors as an apology <laughs> <laughs> and he said if he didn't do that that they would end up calling the police on him oh, that's hilarious <laughs> yeah, I can totally see that being the case. And I guess we're lucky that a lot of the um, the people who do the major voice acting on our show are, are now 
just so filthy rich from the show that their neighbors <laughs> probably would never hear them. <laughs> it's definitely an advantage. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, where, where did the idea to do different shows come from? Like you, you have um, Family Guy and American Dad and the Cleveland show. Uh, where did the idea to come from to separate them out? Well, I know that, uh, you know, American Dad was in the works when I first got to Family Guy. I mean, when I arrived at Family Guy, that was right when American Dad was made, was having its premiere. Mm. Right when Family Guy came back, that's when American Dad also hit the airwaves. So I don't know too much about how that necessarily came about. Um, but in terms of the Cleveland show, I think, you know, people just saw it as a good opportunity to to do a spinoff. And, and I know Seth always um, has admired Norman Lear. You might know him. He's like, he's in his 90s now and he's, he's still around and still working. But he created all those shows like All in the Family. And, yeah. and uh, well, I mean, All in the Family was based on actually a British show, but he brought it to America. And then that show had spinoffs like The Jeffersons, which um, was a show with, you know, African-Americans. And so I think Seth kind of, always saw Family Guy as kind of like it, an all in the family, but animated. And so then it logically made sense to him to say, hey, well, if all in the family can have these spinoffs, maybe Family Guy can do that too. And I think there was a little bit of talk at the beginning about, you know, which character would get a spinoff. And a lot of people want, kind of wanted it to be Quagmire. And, um, but I think uh, the Cleveland show is probably the best choice uh, for that. Yeah, and it was also a great show. And I know, uh, was it cancelled or was that a decision to bring it back, bring him back into Family Guy? Well, I think it was a little bit of both. I feel like, I think that it was on for four seasons. Um, and I can tell you from, I, I used to go to their table reads in season one because they were like right down the hall. And, I, you know, a lot of my friends were working on the show. And, and the table reads for that first season were, unbelievable it was like great um so i know there was a lot of enthusiasm and then i just think they had uh some issues with you know seth's availability to do characters for the show and and it just became kind of more of a logistical nightmare than they had imagined and i think everyone it just felt like at the end of season four everyone was kind of like, let's just bring him back to, to Family Guy and, and go back to the way it was. But I, I do think, you know, when I when I catch the show and I've seen a, a bunch of the uh, Cleveland show episodes, but it always made me laugh. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Cleveland, it's great having Cleveland back and he's, you know, he still makes us laugh on Family Guy. No, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. You're saying you watch a couple of the Cleveland show. Do you watch all the Family Guy episodes when they premiere or would you watch them in you know i it's funny i i didn't not always i mean we working on the show you kind of see the show several times before it comes out on air and when it comes out on air it's maybe a little bit different from the last time we saw it in the writer's room but you end up watching the shows a few times before they they come on so i would say that you know, I used to watch them all all the time on, you know, on Sunday night when it premiered. And then there were a few years where I kind of fell off watching them. And now I think I'm back to, you know, I, I record them now on Sunday. So like on a day like today, I'll uh, at some point today, I'll, I'll watch last night's episode. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I try to now um, because it's, you know, it's satisfying to see and, um, you know, it's, it's just nice to remind yourself that it's, it's going well. Mm, absolutely. No, yeah. yeah. I, um, I started rewatching them all on, uh, Disney plus. Oh yeah. And I did notice that a couple of bits were edited or left out. One in one, I definitely noticed was, um, the episode where Peter's joke, do you know, the one about, uh, I can't remember what it is now. Or it's where they go and search the funniest joke and... Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, they, they edited that. Yeah, they edited the very last bit where he tells the actual joke. And 
I just want to get your opinion on that. What do you think make of, I don't know, Disney's involvement with that? Well, it's funny because I don't even think they're on Disney Plus here in the States. I think you guys get them, (laughs) uh, but we don't. So here in the States, I think they're still just on Hulu. Um, But I I, I knew that that recently we um, had Seth record... Uh, some promos for Disney family guy on Disney plus. And I think it was like just specifically for maybe England and Ireland and, and a, and a few places. So I have not yet seen them uh, on Disney plus. I think it's kind of annoying that they would cut anything out of the show. I mean, it's like they, they bought it, they knew what it was. (laughs) And I think to have your, your, uh, clients paying for a subscription and to say we're going to give you this show but then to edit parts of it I think is not great um, as far as Disney's involvement overall I mean it's kind of a mixed bag like the I love we have great relationships with the actual people there the executives that we've been working with uh, over the years um, so I have no complaints there. Uh, I do feel like at Disney, as opposed to Fox, Disney has like obviously more of a family image. Um, and I, I just have a problem with, uh, we call them standards. It's like the censors, you know, censorship over here. Like I have an issue with that whole, the whole idea of that in general. It's it's like the Wizard of Oz where, you know, you pull back the curtain and there's really nothing there. There's no, it's, it's based on nothing but the daily whims of like a few people who watch the show. There are really no specific guidelines to what you can and can't do on television. And something that you might not know is that you know, you hear about, oh, shows getting fined and we don't want to get fined. We don't want a fine levied against us. We don't want to have to pay and they'll they'll make us pay if we say this or if we do that. No fine that has been levied against a show has ever been enforced ever. Like, because it goes against, you know, the First Amendment. Like, you can't, it's all just what they think might offend their advertisers you know so if they feel like oh we can't tell that joke because walmart is a sponsor and they'll pull out or that you know we can't tell this joke because you know ford is a sponsor and they'll they won't they won't want to be on a show that says something like this there's no it's all just bullshit so it's it that it that rankles me no end because i feel like it's just crazy talk so when i hear that oh it's censored by disney on on their own streaming platform i find that kind of annoying (laughs) (laughs) i was gonna ask you about censorship and everything like that and i was gonna ask is a lot of what you write cut out during like how far are you allowed to push it kind of thing do you know your boundaries well i think we're pretty good at knowing our boundaries uh you know what we can and can't say um you know that said every episode there are notes from standards saying please replace this bit please find a substitute for this please don't say this or say that and w- one of our one uh, the other showrunner his name is rich appel and um he is fantastic he used to be uh, uh an attorney and so he is fantastic at defending you know these notes so when they come in you know if 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 they send us 10 notes on an episode he can usually win like eight of them like he'll he'll go back and argue with standards this is why it's okay that we can say that and it's in this context and you know it's not so bad and whatever um but we do end up losing a couple of things um and it's just inevitable you know they just they have to they have to feel like they've won something so we usually end up giving them a a couple of of notes that they give us but you know it's it's a give and take all the time Mm. do you ever see family guy getting cancelled again i mean (laughs) i you know i don't i don't think so i think at this point 
it's it's proven that it's such a huge uh, kind of money maker, you know, which is really the most important thing in in terms of getting canceled or not getting canceled. Of course. Um, so I think the only thing that will stop Family Guy will be Seth. You know, I think when Seth is tired of doing it, he'll say, "Okay, that's you know, that's enough." Um, but luckily, we haven't reached that point yet, mm. um, and I don't necessarily see any signs that he's he's getting ready to do that. Um, I, you know, never say never. Obviously, anything can happen, and who knows? Maybe the uh, you know the the piercing eye of of uh, cancel culture will will find <laughs> Family Guy and 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 say, hey, stop it, and then Seth will say, well, it's not worth it, but. You know, I, I don't think that right now the the studio or the network would say you're canceled. I don't even think cancel culture works. I mean, they tend to cancel a lot of people every day, and those people still have jobs at Marvel, at Star Wars. At do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Well, I mean, I think money always wins out. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you, you can try to cancel uh, James Gunn or you know at Marvel or someone else but if they're making movies that are making hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars for the studio the studio is going to find a way to to get them back in there and and also you know there's a legitimate feeling that cancel culture sometimes can seem ridiculous you know i I mean this this recent peppy le pew thing to me seems particularly silly uh i saw some some meme or something on Instagram where somebody said, okay, congratulations, you've canceled a, you know, a 70 year old cartoon. And and now my son is on Grand Theft Auto beating up a prostitute. So he doesn't have to pay, <laughs> her, you know? So it's just like, I don't know what really, you could just take it too far. And like, listen, yeah, Pepe Le Pew is certainly like creepy and his attitude is, but that's, he wears that on his sleeve. It was never like a hidden thing that we were supposed to think that he was some kind of a hero and feel sad for him that he's not getting the girl. It was always the joke that he never got the girl and he was always a creep and he's a skunk. Like, I mean, he's literally like how you would describe like a, you know, kind of like a, a backhanded stinky person. So I don't know, that, that one kind of annoyed me. When I saw a couple of months ago that I still don't understand was people were trying to cancel uh, it's a Sebastian Stan because his uh, girlfriend wore a costume to a party. What, what, ex- no, no, sorry, his ex-girlfriend. And she wore a costume of, um, I think it was a Chinese outfit. And people were calling it cultural appropriation. And I don't know why they were trying to cancel him. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> for the actions of an ex-girlfriend i mean that seems a a little bit yeah i don't i mean i think then that that implies something that's even a little more creepy is that somehow sebastian should have had control over her Mm. you know and control over her mind to like not have her do something like that and then that creates its own weird problems so Mm. yeah that that seems ridiculous to me so i I hadn't heard that one but it doesn't surprise me yeah so to be honest, I don't really see Family Guy being cancelled by the cancel culture. I, I don't. <laughs> I, I hope you're right. I hope you're right. <laughs> what about any um, upcoming projects? Like, um, I know for years they've been asking for a Family Guy movie or any other spinoffs that you have in your mind that you, you would pitch or anything. Well, I, I think, you know, I think there will be a Family Guy movie. I don't know how soon it's coming, but every once in a while, Seth, We'll, we'll bring it up, you know, and, and even even recently he he talks about it. And I even think that he himself has a story in mind that he, he wants to tell for the Family Guy movie. I don't know what it is, but he has told me that, you know, he has it in mind what he wants to do for the movie. And now I don't know if he wants the movie to be like the kind of end of Family Guy, but I know that he has it in mind what he wants to do for that so i would say that you can probably rely on you know there will be a family guy movie certainly within you know the next decade and maybe within the next five years 
Okay. Um, we're also working on something that um, with one of your countrymen. Um, we're um, going to be rebooting the uh, Naked Gun franchise oh, wow. with uh, Liam Neeson in the. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow that is yes, brilliant. you can you can break that in ireland actually I, I heard that liam himself was on a, a some kind of a chat show and and said something about that recently so the cat was kind of out of the bag and now i feel like i can actually mention it <laughs> that, that is great because he worked with seth in uh, moving my still in the west how, how did, did that even and happen and why did he have an irish accent <laughs> I know, well, I think that was that was part of the deal. He said he would be in the movie if he could keep his accent. <laughs> so we said okay. And uh, you may remember if it, there's a Family Guy joke about that specifically. It was, um, you know, when when uh, foreign actors play American parts in movies, and it was one of our writers, John Viner, who's very funny, and he was playing liam neeson playing a cowboy ironically <laughs> now and it's like doing that he was just kind of doing that american uh you know british or uh, irish american accent about you know uh, we got a head up river about two kilometers and you know it was just all very kind of thinly veiled irish um but yeah and, and liam was in ted too as well yeah that one very funny scene oh yes <laughs> the cereal at the checkout and I, I think Seth just loves him and which I get I mean he's he's awesome so oh, yeah. um it'll be it'll be fun we're still writing the movie but um hopefully that'll happen and hopefully it'll be as funny as we know he can be I'm really looking forward to that man I didn't, yeah. I didn't even know they were rebooting the franchise yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's very cool well, Alec, I think we've had a great chat. Um, if people want to follow you, where could they find you? Well, uh, they can uh, follow me on Twitter, and my handle is at the sulk. And uh, I'm also on Instagram, uh, which I kind of have more fun doing. It's that's just my name, Alex Sulkin, uh, on Instagram. And other than that, you can just watch Family Guy and chuckle and raise a pint of Guinness in, in my name. <laughs> we will do most certainly well if you've watched this far sound for watching you know tell your grandma about the podcast and stay away from yourself <laughs> top of the morning lads and ladies support for the awful irish podcast is now brought to you by manscaped who is the best in men's global waste grooming manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels and you're no longer lead the look of the irish with the ladies Manscaped just launched in Ireland. We've gone years without using the right tools for the job. You can now be one of the first men in Ireland to experience their life-changing products. Your balls will thank you. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code IRISHPOD at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code IRISHPOD. <laughs>